I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. Uh, in teaching biophysical chemistry, specifically looking at thermodynamics, we've been having a series of homework, suggested homeworks and take-home exams, where a lot of times the solution uh, to these is not is best be, to be worked out computationally or using uh, some type of computer program instead of you know, by hand uh, for several reasons. Uh, one and is, is that when you create something in a general way and say a spreadsheet program like Excel or what we have up today, which is Google Sheets, I use this because it's freely available, easy to share with people and, and more or less most spreadsheet type programs uh, work similar to each other. So this one works very similar to something like Excel uh, or numbers uh, for Mac users, etc. cetera. Um, and when you create these, you know, using a program like this, it's easy to then take this and change it to different types of problems. So for example, the one that is explicit on exam number two, problem 11 for the spring 2018 semester, is asking when you start with something in a super cooled uh, liquid state, say at minus 25 degrees where you have water uh, at that temperature, and then you, your final state is, is ice at, at minus 25 degrees. Now let's put this a little more in context uh, to something more practical. If you take you know, water, you put it you know, into a mold of some say, an ice cube thing, you put it into your freezer, it does not you know, start to freeze when it gets to zero degrees. It almost always supercools a fair amount. And the amount it supercools depends on quite a few factors, the size of the water, because um, it's dictated by nucleation and growth, which, um, but it, it will cool significantly underneath the temperature of zero degrees Celsius or 33 degrees Fahrenheit before it actually starts to freeze into ice, into a solid form of H2O. Uh, so this is in a sense fairly practical as far as now, so we're asking if it makes it all the way down to minus 25 degrees Celsius before it freezes. Uh, so our starting point is minus 25 degrees Celsius water. And anytime water goes below zero degrees, we call it super cold water. But it's following the same thermodynamic behavior as water was in the normal liquid state. And it still behaves the same. When it's as a supercooled liquid, it's still moving around like liquid. It still behaves just like liquid water, just colder. Um, and so we get it all the way down to minus 25. That's our starting position. Now it freezes. And so uh, it'll freeze and we want to say, and our freezer is say set at minus 25 degrees, uh, so it will, the final state will be solid ice at minus 25 degrees Celsius. And so we want to know, for example, what's the change in the energy or entropy, you know, during this process? And how does it differ from if you were just to do this right at zero degrees? So uh, this same type of, if you set the spreadsheet up correctly, you can look at any of the phase transitions. So you could start with ice, you know, melt it, go through liquid, and then go all the way to steam and look at that as well. So in this, I've set up where uh, I put, you know, uh, water uh, or, or H2O in, in both the solid form as ice, as in the liquid form, water, and in the gaseous form or vapor form as steam. And I put basically the thermodynamic parameters in here for it. And so these are, you know, uh, inputs where I've, I've added the heat capacity, the uh, delta H of formation, uh, the entropy at uh, standard temperatures, and even the Gibbs energy. I've also put things about the uh, phase transition. So it's delta H and delta S of fusion uh, going uh, from a solid to a liquid and vaporization going uh, from a liquid to a gas, right? So now I have all these parameters and I can look at them, I can look at the changes as you go through uh, different temperatures. But one of the nicest things to do, and so I've added the temperature here, and I've, you know, calculated something about, you know, for example, you know, in this case, the entropy, and 
I've done that, as you can see here, by taking into account the heat capacity, its change over temperature, um, there we go, uh, you know, and, you know, adding that to, you know, the value above. So I'm able to create a chart of how the entropy changes or, um, leaving that one over here, you know, how the enthalpy is changing by taking the enthalpy and then I'm again taking its heat capacity and its change in temperature. Um, so uh, I'm able to make a list of numbers, but it's often really helpful to see this more graphically. And so I went ahead and plotted some of these values. Um, so, and this is what I mean by it can make a lot more intuitive. We're starting at this point right here, uh, and we're ending, you know, at ice right below it. So in a sense, the delta S is just, you know, the distance or, or between there and there, right? So entropy is a state function, so is enthalpy or any of the energies we're looking at. So we can look at a path to calculate that. We can go from here, we can calculate the, C, you know, how the heat capacity changes till we get to zero, then we can use the delta S of fusion and then go from here back to minus 25, right? And so, um, you know, but we can, so we're starting here, you know, at, at, at minus 25 degrees, and this is in the, you know, supercooled liquid state, or supercooled water. And it's supercooled until it gets to this point at zero degrees Celsius, right? So. Here we're looking at, you know, CP uh, on T, you know, change, right? How it's changing over temperature from here to here, right? Now we can use the delta S fusion at zero degrees to get that component. So we'll get a, a delta S one here, we'll call that this, and then we'll you know, get to minus 25 here, which is another, you know, CP on TDT to this point right here. Um, but we can look at it. In fact, this is one of the things Gibbs himself did, that you can tell, you know, where you're going to end up in, in a plot like this, and that, um, you know, we know what the delta S of fusion is, and that's, you know, this right here. Well, you can see, like, you know, basically, we're here and here. I mean, our new delta S is this right here. That's from, you know, which is the same as this distance right here. So it's just a little less, you know. And in fact, you could even, by knowing the slope here and the slope here, you can even geometrically, you know, calculate this just using geometry instead of this. In other words, any path you know, that gets you from here to here uh, is fine. So we're using an equilibrium pass because we can calculate this from here to here to there. But you can see graphically what this ends up, you know, looking like. So, and sure enough, when you look at this, our delta S of fusion is, you know, this distance right here is 22. Um, you know, for one mole would be, you know, uh, 22 uh, joule per K right here. And, you know, we get this distance you can even see graphically because this is to scale is just a little smaller than that. This goes down, this slope is a little larger, so it cuts off a fair amount of that. This one doesn't add near as much back to it. And we get, you know, minus 18. And again, like, you know, while if we did this at zero, uh, we would be getting minus 22.1 uh, joule per k mole. Uh, then we can take into an account the exact amount uh, to get, you know, the delta S, but uh, we can see this in moles. You get the same thing if you do, uh, I plotted the entropy here, but you can do the same thing for enthalpy. So I hope this gives you a graphical way of looking at this and motivates uh, a reason to set this up in something like a spreadsheet versus just, you know, analytically working it by uh, hand. Thank you.